Welcome to today's webinar, courtesy of the Kentucky Small Business Development Center, right here in Louisville. We're all about hooking you up with free, super secret business coaching and training services. It doesn't matter if you're just dipping your toes in or gearing up for a big expansion. We've got the goods, the tools, and the know-how to help you win. To get the scoop, cruise on over to LouisvilleSmallBusiness.com or hit us up at 502-977-5800. Big thanks for tuning in to today's webinar. Feel free to drop your questions or chat it up with our speaker using the chat feature. Let's dive in. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Dave Etkin. I'm the director here at the Louisville Small Business Development Center. Thanks for joining us on another Toolkit Tuesday. We're always honored that you'll take a little bit of time out of your day and join us. And um, as always, I'm joined with my good friend and coworker, Janet Flaw. Hey, Janet. Hey, Dave. How are you today? Doing great. It's beautiful outside. It's a beautiful day in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so I hope you're, <laughs> where, the weather's great where you are. If not, sorry to, sorry to hear that. But anyway, so just to make sure that you can hear and see us and everything's working well, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a toolbar. If you don't, just take your cursor and hover over that. It should pop up and there you'll see the little chat button, click on that and just uh, tell us hello and tell us your name and where you're joining from so you can you can hear us and uh, make sure that um, everything is working well. We want to make sure that you can um, you can see and hear as well. And I know there's people out there because I can see you. Hey, Bevan from Louisville. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate you. Appreciate you joining. Okay, Shelton, Auburn, Alabama. Wow, you get the travel award today, Shelton. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Kendra from Louisville, Elizabeth from Mayfield, Kentucky. That's a cute little town. Um, Florence from Northern Kentucky. Hey, Bobby from Louisville. Hey, Tammy. In Lexington, great to see you today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, this has been, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I guess everything's working well. Well, um, you know, we here at the uh, Small Business Development Center, we are confronted with a lot of changing business environments and we've gotten a lot of requests and we've really been you know, diving deep into this, but um, you know, using AI for business is really, really important. And, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of quotes where um, it says that, uh, that AI will probably not uh, replace uh, people's jobs. Only the people who don't know how to use AI will be replaced. But those that are skilled in AI will generally thrive as, uh, as new technologies always create new jobs, but it takes keeping up. So, what we wanted to do is bring some resources um, to bear so that we can all learn a little bit and get started. If you're at ground zero, this is a good place to start. If not, uh, I'm sure you'll learn some extra things today. But we are honored to have our guest today, uh, Ben Nguyen, who is from Shriner University in Texas. Uh, he is the Director for Talent and Workforce Development there. And um, I'm, I'm so glad you're here today. Ben, how are you? Hi, Dave. I'm doing great, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think uh, it's 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 in the morning in in Kerbal. Let's let's. Uh, I mean, uh, in Louisville. So let's assume that. Good morning, everyone. Good <laughs> afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hope everyone had a great morning, and we are looking forward to a great session together yeah. today as well. Let me just uh, say uh, as we go through. Um... You know uh, Ben's uh, presentation today. If you have any questions or comments, uh, just put it in the chat, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get to it. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to ask specific questions to an expert that can give you the answers. So don't miss this opportunity. And uh, we have all day, so we'll stay here all day if we need to. So um, take advantage of that. So so Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's get started. We've got a lot to cover today. Thank you. Thank you so much once again, Dave and Janet. Um, and thank you everyone for joining today's webinar on workforce development in the AI era, uh, particularly designed for SMEs and uh, business professionals. 
So let me, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put up my presentation here. Please let me know if you can't see anything, but it looks like it's up on the screen here already. Looks great, Ben. Excellent. Well, once again, thank you very much to the SBDC office at the University of Kentucky Louisville. Uh, great team, wonderful opportunity to share some insights on Gen AI with you um, today in the most realistic way, especially once again for business professionals and SMEs today. A little bit about myself, I'm Ben, Ben Nguyen. Um, my last name pronounced is just like W-I-N, and I got a lot of questions about how to say it. Uh, and, you know, someone just telling me, hey, I know a couple of other wins. Uh, are you related or something like that? Actually, Win is a pretty common last name for Vietnamese. I originally came from Vietnam, um, so it's like W-I-N. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for Talent and Workforce Development at Shriner University, Texas. Uh, my background has a blend of business, technology, and workforce development in the last nine years. Uh, I'm also a certified senior professional in human resources and a member of the National Association of uh, Workforce Development, uh, development Professionals. So it's, it's very interesting that this background kind of gives me a very well-rounded perspective to talk about AI these days because I'm not just looking at it from the technical standpoints, but also with a very business and human centric perspective. And that's also what I, uh, that's uh, what I would like to bring to, the, to you today, a very realistic approach about AI. Uh, that's gonna be very practical and down to earth. But before we jump in, I want to ask you uh, something. How many of you feel kind of overwhelmed with all the AI news lately? So please type yes in the chat box. Yes. So, you know, every day, it seems like there's something new about AI, right? Lately, when I talk with my colleagues, AI is one of the hot topics. So in academia, we are also discussing how AI will affect our students' learning experience and outcomes and what to do at the department levels on how to develop policies for AI usages when designing the courses and, you know, for our students to, to uphold the integrity of the academic achievements, etc. And, and for, for business, it's pretty much the same. How is AI going to change everything? Take over jobs or will we need to learn Python or how to build our own machine learning models, right? So with all the noise out there, it can be a lot to take in. And we might wonder, what should I do for myself and my business? So today I wanna to cut through all the noise and help you see AI for what it really is. And I would do that by asking a lot of questions, okay? And I would challenge you to take many different perspectives. Are you ready for that? Let's get started. So by the end of this session, I want you to walk away with these three things. First, I want you to have a clear picture of where AI stands today. What's real and what's high? Clarify some myths and misconceptions, etc. Second, I want you to know what you should learn at which level in order to boost productivity and have the right implementation roadmap, not only for yourself, but also for your organizations, all without the need to become a tech expert. And third, I want you to make sure that you are aware of some important ethical considerations and concerns around using Gen AI, from data privacy to potential biases, um, we will cover why it's crucial to think responsibly about how we use AI, okay? So let's get started by talking about why AI is all over the place these days, right? 
and why it can sometimes be more confusing than helpful. AI is everywhere, and you hear about it in the news, on social media, and maybe even at work. I'm sure some of you have heard people say AI is going to replace jobs, change industries, or even take over things, uh, and you know, conquer the world or something like that. All kind of messages out there. But let me invite you to shift your perspective to a different angle a little bit. You see the companies I put on the screen, right? These companies. So how many of you have been used any of these tools in the last five years or so? How many of you have been used any of these tools in the last five years? I know I, I personally use Google, Facebook, and Amazon products every single day. And I mean, like for at least 15 years or so already, they're actually a part of my daily routine. These tools have transformed how we live and work. And guess what? They are all powered by AI. Take Google, for example. Every time you search, AI is there. Understanding what you're looking for, ranking results, and personalizing your experience. It's behind Google Maps too, right? When you use Google Maps, it's uh, kind of predict traffic and suggest faster routes for you, right? Or Facebook. This one, have you ever wondered why you see those particular posts or those particular friend suggestions or videos on your newsfeed? Actually, there's an AI behind it. Specifically learns what you engage with and personalizes your experience to keep you spend more time on the screen. And then there's Netflix, right? Have you ever noticed why or how it seems to know exactly what you want to watch next. That's AI too. It constantly analyzing what you watch, how long you watch, and even when you stop watching something, so it can recommend the next movie for you. Or this guy, Amazon. Wow, I mean, like they use AI to predict what products you might like, and then you know make recommendations based on your browsing history, your shopping history, to do what to make you buy more. And Siri, this one, full-blown virtual assistant, right? Way before ChatGPT. It can recognize your voice, understand your natural language, respond to you, and do what you want it to do, like schedule an appointment, call someone, or text someone, right? So through the products of these companies, we have used AI for years already. Well, mostly without knowing it. So is AI something really new, new? No, it's not. It has a history of more than 70 years. And it's not something new. So that is something we need to be clear with ourselves first, right? AI is not something new. So now, if AI is not something new, then what has made AI such a huge blast these days? So here's a chart showing Google search trends for the term AI over the last uh, five years. So you will see for most of this time, hardly anyone was talking anything about AI. And it was kind of just there silently and just for a small group of tech people, very much in the background. Then boom, November 2022. OpenAI launched ChatGPT, and that launch changed everything, right? Certainly, AI is everywhere, and everyone wanted to know more about AI. From there, AI went from being something only the tech tree talked about to the topic you see everywhere today. And it's no surprise that all the AI talks put a lot of pressure on us, right? as business owners, HR professionals, managers, leaders, et cetera. We, we might be wondering, uh, should I use AI? Am I missing out on something important? Um, what's the right way to think about this? Uh, what should I do uh, about AI for my company, my team, my business, et cetera? So here's what I have noticed. When it comes to AI, people usually fall into 
uh, one of these two groups. So the first group is super excited. They think that AI is the answer to everything and that it's going to fix all their problems overnight. They might be rushing uh, to learn every new tool or feel like they need to master AI right away. And then the second group right here is more cautious, more conservative. They are not so sure about AI and maybe a bit scared of it. They, they, they think it might be too complicated or just another passing trend. So they avoid it as much as possible until their boss requires them to take a look at it or learn something about it, right? Anyone here feel related? Yeah. So as you might guess, the reality is that neither group is exactly right. AI is powerful, yes, but it's not the magic. It won't solve all your problems with just a, a push of a button, or at least you know, for, for it to get to that point, it might take us a very long time. At the same time, it's not also something that you can ignore completely. The key here is to find the middle ground. We should be using AI to help us work smarter and get things done faster. But we don't need to know all the technical stuff to get overwhelmed by it, okay? It's about using AI as a tool, right? The main idea, the core mindset here is to just consider it as a new tool. That's it. Now, let's take a step back to reflect on similar tech hives that already happened so we can analyze how AI is similar and or different from these technologies, okay? So remember when everyone was talking about blockchain a few years ago, you know, or virtual reality or the metaverse, right? If you recall it, just a few years ago, we also heard a lot about these technologies. Now, where are they? Right? Learning, disappear. And AI is going through a very similar cycle of hype right now. So to understand this better, I want to introduce something called the Gartner hype cycle. It's a way of looking at how new technologies rise and then fall in popularity. And more importantly, where AI fits in right now. So this is the Gartner Hive Cycle, a model that describes the typical progression of a technology from its introduction to mainstream adoption. It has five phases. The first one is called the innovation trigger or the technology trigger. Uh, this is when a new technology is introduced and there's a lot of excitement, but not many people are actually using it yet. And by the way, actually AI, as I mentioned earlier, is not a new technology and it has a history of over 70 years already back to World War II. Um, that, that was the first phase of AI that we already uh, mentioned. That is the innovation trigger phase right there. Next is the peak of inflated expectations. This is where the high really takes off. Early publicity, produces success stories and a lot of enthusiasm. This is this phase, peak of inflated expectation. The next phase is the trough of disillusionment. So what does it mean? Well, this is the phase where the reality sets in and the technology doesn't quite live up to the high sky expectations. In other words, experiments and implementations fail to deliver. And phase number four, we have the slope of enlightenment. At this point, people start to figure out what the technology can actually do. It's not magic, but it will you know, start leaning toward more realistic and practical uses. And finally, we, we reach the plateau of productivity. This is when the technology becomes widely used and works well for specific tasks. So that is the Gartner High Cycle. Now, where does AI fit into all of this? Well, right now, AI is somewhere between the peak of inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment. It's somewhere right here. A lot of people are super excited about AI and think it will solve everything. 
But as more businesses start using AI, they are they are realizing that it's not quite there yet. It's not going to fix um, every problem overnight. And it's part of the cycle that almost every new technology goes through. People get really excited, and then there's disappointment when it doesn't deliver. The same thing happened with blockchain, VR, and the metaverse. They pretty much disappear from the media. We barely hear anything much about them lately. These technologies are still around and they are being used in specific ways that make sense, but they are no longer treated like they would change everything overnight. And we haven't heard much about them like we used to a few years ago, right? Right. If you, if you kind of pay attention to that. So, Will AI end up the same way? Kind of disappear after a few years, just like a passing trend and we are all wasting time here on this thing called AI. Why or why not? Okay, so let me ask you this question. As I shared with you earlier, I'm gonna ask a lot of questions and challenge you to take different perspectives. How many of you have used these AI chatbots in the last seven days? Yeah, right. And how many of you have done anything? I mean, you have done anything about blockchain, VR, or metaverse in the last six months. And why? Right? Of course, because it's so easy to use Chat GPT, Google Gemini, and Copilot. It's cheap, it's easy, it's free. All you need is just a computer and the internet, and then you can. You can use them right away. And other technologies are so difficult to use for, you know, for us to even understand their concepts, right? You see the difference? So the key word here is democratization. This is what AI has and the other technologies don't. It means to put AI into the hands of users without AI specializations or technical knowledge thereby empowering these individuals with the benefits and opportunities of the technology. And because, and because of this characteristic of AI technology, it's, it's so easy to use for the general public. It doesn't require you to have any technical background to use it, while blockchain or VR are mostly just for the tech people. And that's what makes AI the household names it's becoming something the general public can actually use daily instead of, the, of a technology limited to just a handful of highly skilled uh, programmers or engineers. And Gartner asserts that democratized AI will level the playing field in terms of access to information and skills, calling it one of the most disruptive trends of this decade. So by now, I hope that you've got a solid understanding of the hype cycle that most technologies go through and how AI fits into that cycle. And some of the key similarities and differences between AI and other technologies to answer the question, if AI is just a passing trend and why, right? So right now you're probably seeing a lot of headlines and you know, get overwhelmed by it and you know, there are training programs, courses, and stories about how AI is doing amazing things. But how do we navigate them? How, how do we navigate these stories that we receive that, that, that bombarding us every single day? How to be a little bit selective? So here's, here's the thing. Have you realized that most of those AI success stories come from huge corporations like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, right? We barely see much stories from SMEs, right? Simply because F SMEs like our businesses don't have a ton of money sitting around waiting to be spent or wasted. So for small businesses, jumping into the hive can be a lot riskier. That's why it's important for us to focus on realistic affordable AI solutions that fit our specific needs instead of trying to copy whatever the big corporations are doing. 
And over the next few years, AI is going to move into what we call the plateau of productivity. And that's when things calm down a bit and AI really starts to deliver consistent value, helping businesses run more smoothly. And so in this webinar, we just learned that before we get to that point, we've got to get through this phase where expectations are way overhyped and disappointments start popping up. So in short, is AI overhyped right now? Absolutely. <laughs> Will there be some disappointment because the technology can't deliver on every promise and a lot of money will get wasted? Definitely. But will AI disappear like blockchain or VR did? Probably not. Why? Because it's democratized. Almost anyone can use it now. And the more people using it, the faster it will develop and the longer it will stick around. Now, why should you care about this? As business professionals, if you rush into the AI expecting it to fix all your problems, you're going to be disappointed. But if you ignore AI completely, you might miss out on some real opportunities when it matures. The key here is to understand both the big picture and in depth about what's going on so we can make informed decisions about what to do with AI, right? So when talking about how businesses can get started with AI, from my experience, it doesn't have to be super complicated. It's actually pretty common sense, just like when we apply change management process in any project or uh, apply any change uh, in our organization. Now, let me share with you a simple roadmap that has four steps you can use for your organizations right away. And actually by taking uh, this webinar, you, are, uh, you already started. And these four steps are going to give you a clear direction on what to do next. Step number one is upskill and reskill on AI. Start by getting familiar with AI tools like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, Microsoft Copilot, etc. So there are tons of resources out there like this educational program to help you understand the basics and keep up with the latest trends. And because this foundational knowledge is super important, it helps you to know the big picture very comprehensive, so you can make informed decisions about implementing AI at your company. And it could help you save ton of money and time that could have been wasted otherwise. Talking about upskilling and reskilling, you might be wondering, do I need to learn how to code Python or manage AI projects myself? Well, unless you are in tech or project management, the answer is generally no. Those complex Gen AI projects, things like preparing data, selecting models, and training them, that's, that's the ter territory of the tech professionals, okay? So you, you might have an in-house team for it, or you might choose to outsource. It's very simple. It's just like what you would do for building a website or a mobile app. It's their job to handle the technical heavy lifting so you don't have to. And according to the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report, the demand for AI and machine learning specialists is on the rise. So those technical roles will be covered by the tech people, right? For business professionals and business owners like ourselves, it makes more sense to focus on learning how to effectively use Gen AI tools like ChatGPT and other AI software, because eventually, Gen AI skills like mastering these assistants will be as essential and basic as knowing how to use Microsoft Office or QuickBooks. In fact, a study by MIT Sloan Management Review points out that AI literacy rather than deep technical knowledge will be crucial for most business professionals. So do we need to learn about AI? Yeah, absolutely. But to what extent? Enough to understand how it works and how to use AI tools like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, and Copilot. 
as effective as you would use Microsoft Office. That's it. And leave the data and machine learning details to the specialist. Okay. I think that, that sounds better. So the, the next step is AI training for your team. Once you've got the hang of AI, then it's time to start training your team. This gets everyone on the same page and ready to use AI effectively. A well-trained team can seamlessly integrate AI into their daily workflows, um, boosting overall productivity, especially for your office workers who don't need uh, to have any technical background. And a great thing about it is that your company, your department, or yourself don't need to spend a huge budget on this. Tools like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, Microsoft Copilot, et cetera, they are free or very affordable to use. And they are great starting points already. And as I mentioned earlier, eventually these AI skills will be as essential as Microsoft Office or QuickBooks. Just like some of you might have heard, AI won't replace humans, but the ones who know how to use AI will, re will replace those who don't, just like Dave mentioned earlier. Same thing for businesses. That's why we are seeing a huge shift in the economy worldwide. So businesses who adapt well will have a significant advantage in the competition. Next, automate business operations. Begin by identifying repetitive tasks that can be automated. Think about customer service with AI chatbots marketing content creation, or HR processes like onboarding. Now, I would like for you to, to take a minute to think about this. Think about all the work that you and your team typically spend your time on each day and see if the majority of those time-consuming tasks are administrative or not. Like sending emails, filing paperwork, data entry, categorizing documents and information, et cetera. And you can use pre-built products that are powered by AI to help you with all these tasks. Think about bookkeeping, right? For example, if you need a software for bookkeeping, you don't need to build that software yourself. All you need to do is just buy a subscription of QuickBooks, right? That would be this step. And once again, it's very, it's very realistic and practical here. And you don't have to spend hundreds of thousand dollars to build your own AI system at this point. And you know, for the majority of what you need, there might have been an AI for that already. And yes, I encourage you to check out this website. There's an AI for that.com. Yeah, go check it out after this webinar, okay? So there are tons of AI-powered applications and services out there for what you need already. So you can implement at your organization without you having to learn how to code or train an AI model, et cetera. Let me share with you a story. Lately, I have been working with one of the biggest university systems in the country, um, and they still use PDF files for onboarding employees. So new hires, have to download several PDF files, fill them out, and then upload them to a portal or email them to the HR department. And guess what? When the HR department receives those forms, they need someone to manually enter the data from the forms into the HR information system. I mean, how much time and productivity are wasted every single day on these mundane tasks for both employees and the employers? AI can help with all of this. Simply let the new hires fill out an online form that can be imported directly into the HRIS system. And if they want to double check, they can always set a step for an HR team member to review the submitted information. Then if everything looks good, just click a button to import the data into the system. And with AI, that AI team member, that HR team member could be an AI power software to review that step as well. Another example, Salesforce Einstein is pretty incredible for building AI chatbots that integrate uh, with your CRM. 
So I'm pretty sure that a lot of small businesses out there are using Salesforce. Handle custom questions, collect leads, offer product recommendations, process orders, or you know even handle refunds all 24-7. So basically, it's like having a typeless online sales agent constantly bringing in business, never complains or text breaks, right? So think about how much time and productivity your business can save by using technology and how quickly you can get things done and how many more strategic tasks you and your team can focus on instead of wasting time on mundane tasks. So if you ask me what to do for workforce development and AI integration at your organization, here's what I think. If you can make it all the way through these three steps, from upskilling and reskilling on AI to training your team and actually implement some AI software to streamline your business operations, then you're already ahead of the game, okay? You are keeping things practical, affordable, avoiding all the hype, and most importantly, not wasting a ton of time and money. Because if we ever invest in something, well, in business, right? If we ever invest in something, we want to have the highest possible ROI. And we would say no to wasting resources, right? And the final step we have here on this roadmap is develop tailored AI solutions. This step is a little bit further down the road, especially for businesses need custom AI system for specific needs that they cannot find anywhere else. Imagine something like building an AI system to monitor all the machines in a factory, detecting unusual activities and make real-time adjustments, something like that. And, and, and you cannot find any pre-built AI system for it. This involves deeper AI integration and requires solid AI knowledge and experience. Um, and for most of the time as an SME, to be honest with you, you don't need it. But when it comes to the need to be such a system, you just hire a company to do it for you, as we mentioned earlier. And once again, from my experience, both in tech and business, the first three steps are quick and easy for almost every company to deploy, and it can drastically boost productivity for you already. A report from Gartner saying that AI will add to the global economy $15.7 trillion by 2030, and $6.6 .6 trillion from that comes from enhanced productivity. So once again, AI skills will eventually become essential for office workers, business professionals, business leaders, and more. It's just like knowing how to use email over snail mail or Microsoft Office over the old typewriter. And this is a massive shift in how we work, do business, and develop our workforce in the AI era. So how can SME start using AI without falling into the trap of overhype promises? It's simple. Focus on practical, affordable applications that make sense for your business. You don't need to invest in AI to completely overhaul your operations. Just start small, train yourself and your team on AI literacy, how to use AI tools like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, et cetera, effectively. Learn the guideline of using AI safely and responsibly, et cetera. Just those things are more than enough. Okay, no Python. <laughs> No data mining, no machine learning, fine tuning for you. None of those would be relevant to business professionals like you and your team. Now, as we talk about how business professionals can reap the benefits of Gen AI tools, there are also some risks that come with the technology. So let's talk about four big ones you need to keep in mind. Inaccuracy. The most recognized risk of using Gen AI is inaccuracy. It's pretty obvious though. When you log into uh, ChatGPT, you can see the chat box here at the bottom. Uh, it says ChatGPT can make mistakes, right? Check important information. Same thing for 
Google Gemini right here. Gemini may display inaccurate info, including about people, so double check its response. So it's a, it's a disclaimer right there. It's a disclaimer. If you are um, doing something really important or sensitive with uh, ChatGPT or other AI chatbots in general, just be really careful, okay? So what to keep in mind? Always verify the information provided by AI chatbots with reliable sources, especially when, when it comes to critical or sensitive topics like legal, medical, or financial advice. A good way to do it is, is just copy the response you got from a chatbot and then paste it to another chatbot and ask it to fact check. Yeah, simple, right? So something like if you are using ChatGPT, uh, ask it some legal or some updates or some research, and then it will give you a, the, the, a response, right? You just copy that entire thing and paste to Microsoft Copilot and ask the Copilot bot to fact check the GPT's response and you will see how they work together. And, and that, that's how I usually do to verify the information I, I receive from these chatbots. The next thing is um, to understand that AI chatbots may not always have access to the most up-to-date information and their responses are based on the data that, it, that they were trained on, which may be outdated or incomplete sometimes. Um, at this point uh, today when we are talking, there are chatbots out there having the uh, capability to do uh, live search on the internet, but it's still not there yet. It's not perfect. So keep in mind that their data or the information they give you could be outdated or incomplete. Okay. Last but not least, use Gen AI applications and AI chatbots as tools, not decision makers. Okay. So I, I offer trainings for some companies and universities and some of my learners ask me how not to be dependent on AI tools. And this is the approach. Just use them as tools to support you, help you get things done faster and more efficient. But the one who makes the final call, the one who makes the final decision is you, not them, not any of these AI chatbots, okay? Number two is data management risk. Say, for example, an employee copies and pays proprietary corporation information into these systems to generate a presentation. Now, because these AIs are continuing to learn from the internet and information, the information that they receive, anything provided to these AI chatbots could show up in response to another person's request. And that could expose information to unauthorized people. You know, also the tech company on the back end is capturing what you're doing. And so if you have private information and you use it in a prompt, be very cautious. You know, it's like that information can be and possibly be stored on the open AI servers or Google servers. So you basically don't have much control right there. Therefore, it's crucial to remember, never upload or provide any sensitive documents like financial documents, bank account, um, social security num numbers, or any other sensitive info to the publicly available AI chatbots like ChatGPT, Google Gemini, etc. These platforms are great but they are not designed to handle confidential information securely. So once again, what well, to keep in mind, do not share personal, confidential, or sensitive information with AI chatbots unless you are certain about the data protection measures in place. Before using an AI chatbot, review the privacy policies of the provider to understand how your data will be used, stored, and protect it. And where possible, provide only anonymous or non-identifiable information to minimize the privacy risks. Copyright infringement. So copyright infringement is a huge concern for businesses. 
About 70% of companies in a survey listed copyright as their top reason for not using Gen AI. Because these AI tools are trained on material found on the internet, and much of that information could be copyrighted, right? Leading to a host of legal problems for businesses. For example, a national newspaper is in the middle of a copyright infringement lawsuit claiming a popular Gen AI system used millions of existing articles to train its language models. So if this is the case, any information from those articles um, could now be showing up in responses to users everywhere and potentially reused without proper citing or reference. What to keep in mind? Treat the content generated by AI chatbots as a starting point or inspiration and ensure you create original content or properly cite sources when using outputs in professional or public context. And be aware that while AI chatbots can produce content quickly, the ownership of that content can be legally ambiguous. Always review and if necessary, modify the output to avoid IP violations. And lastly, when in doubt, consult with a legal professional specializing in intellectual property to ensure that you are on the right side of the law right? It's, it's better to be cautious and diligent. Ethical implications and bias. Bias is similarly everywhere, and these AI chatbots are no exception. These algorithms might unintentionally reinforce biases inherent in the data that they are trained on, potentially resulting in unfair or discriminatory outcomes using these biased AI system can result um, in ethical issues and might even damage to a business reputation. So what to keep in mind is always review the chatbot's responses critically, especially when dealing with sensitive topics that could be influenced by societal biases. And if a chatbot produces a biased or inappropriate response, provide feedback to the provider to help improve the system. Most chatbots have this mechanism for reporting such issues. Um, so while AI chatbots offer incredible advantages, it's crucial to be aware of these risks and manage them effectively. So let's wrap up what we cover today, okay? First, we took a look at the Gartner Hive cycle, seeing where AI stands right now, we cut through the high to get a clearer picture of what's actually real, what to expect, and what's best to do. Second, we talk about how to approach learning and implementing AI, focusing on the skills that you uh, and your team and your workforce need and the right steps to take. Remember, you don't have to be a tech expert to start seeing real benefits for yourself and your organization. And finally, we cover some of the ethical questions around AI, like data privacy and biases. We also talk about what to keep in mind, how to avoid them, uh, and all those good stuff. So with those three things, um, you are already, I, I, I trust that you are now ready to move forward with a solid understanding of AI, a practical plan, and what to keep in mind um, to make AI really works for you and your organization. So um, at this point, I think we have a few more minutes for our Q&A. So feel free to ask any question about Gen AI, the topic we covered today, or anything else that you might be curious about. Or you can get in touch with me via the contact info on screen I'm here too. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. That was uh, that was a lot. That was fantastic, actually. Hopefully, so, it's not too overwhelming. <laughs> it, was, it was very overwhelming. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. Absolutely, it was, <laughs> which is which is great. Um, so, so if uh, anybody out there has any questions or comments, uh, please put them in the chat there, and we'll talk to Ben about it. Um, in the meantime, 
Um, I, I have a quick question. I guess I, I don't want to go too deep in the weeds, but but I'm going to take a chance here. Um, when you were talking about using um, AF or re repetitive tasks, um, you gave the example of maybe you know entering um, forms into a database or something like that. I mean, that takes a little bit of programming skill to implement that, doesn't it? Well, that right now with uh, and, and thank you for your question. This is this is a very real question right there. Um, in order for us to implement these systems, they are very simple. And for example, let's say um, the example I, I mentioned earlier, employee onboarding, right? So instead of you having someone to fill everything on a PDF file or on a paper, and then you have to scan and then, or you know, type in the to the system, you just have to put together a form, something like a Google form could do the work. That mm -hmm. could do the trick. And then you can use systems like uh, Zapier or Mac. Those are automation systems that right. can link these apps together and you don't, you don't have to learn how to code or you don't need to know how to code in order to use these systems. These are very user-friendly. Right. And, and that is, I think that is one of the steps. I think step three, when we implement um, automation in our daily business operations uh, to boost up productivity and you know we don't have to waste time in those mundane tasks. So I do have a list of tools that we all can use that I would be more than happy to share with anyone who's interested yeah. in um, this list of tool that you know give you a little bit more specifics. Yeah, if you don't mind sharing that with Janet, she could push it out to everyone. Um, and everybody could yeah. benefit from that. That would be fantastic. I would really, i really enjoy that. Um, here's another question. Since uh, since I can ask the questions, um, it seems to, to it seems to me that um, you have to get good at understanding and structuring the prompt questions. Um, what? What are your best practices, your tips, or the things that you've learned on how to structure um, setting up a prompt um, to have a successful interchange or get some good information from, from chat, for example? I, I love this question. I think it's 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 the right one, very specific, and I think it's going to be very helpful. So talking about prompt engineering, um, the key mindset is to consider this say chat GPT, right? Just use it. And you know, if you want to use Google Gemini or Microsoft Copilot, that's fine. But just, let's say it's chat GPT. Just consider chat GPT is your assistant, just like a human. If you want your assistant to do something, you need to first give them some context, right? Give them some kind of context, give them some starting points, some information for them to know exactly what you're looking for. So some of the tips that I always share when talking about prompt engineering is number one, give context. For example, if you would like to build, um, you, you need help with building your personal branding. You need to provide them a contact saying that, hey, I'm the director of the Center for Talent Workforce Development at Strana University or you know at SBDC. Uh, Louisville, and I'm looking to build my professional branding that I could use on LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, I want to uh, position myself as a leader in, let's say, AI for uh, workforce development or something like that. And then, you know, the more specific you give the AI, the better it will respond to you because right now it understands you better. It understands what you want it to do better. So always provide those details. And sometimes you can put them all together in one prompt. You don't have to you know, break them down in different little messages because sometimes it's, it, it makes the AI confused. And to be honest with you, these AI chatbots are not perfect. They, they are not perfect. They, they got confused a lot of times because I use them on a single, every single day, I know that they are not perfect. Uh, yeah. So give them some context, give them some good information, be specific, even the format that you want them to respond to you.
for example, if you want them to give you a calendar for social media posts, or you want a table of content, you want bullet points, just be specific. And then it will understand exactly what you need and then it will give you better responses. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, yeah, I just as a, a little tidbit, a, a friend of mine who's um, studying for the bar exam um, has prompts where he, he has um, chat quiz him on law questions. So, uh, so it's almost like a study, a study buddy, basically. And uh, yes, so that, um, yes, yeah. Um, so, um, let's see, here's a question from Bobby. He goes, um, I was wondering if AI would be different on the Gardner curve due to the continuous development of faster, more powerful hardware and how the recent announcement of Amazon, Google, and OpenAI investing in nuclear power. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you asked that. That's a that's a cool question. I'm not quite sure about the nuclear power the AI, but I do know that there's, I think just yesterday, IBM released a new AI model that's claimed to be more powerful than OpenAI, ChatGPT, and other systems out there. And you know, with the with the development of hardware and the abundance of data, because one of the reasons why AI didn't develop much in the last 70 years until right now is they didn't have a lot of data. Right now we have a bunch of data on the internet and everything we do is being recorded. So that data is a mind field for is a goal field for, for us to develop AI systems. So I think AI development will develop a lot and we will see a lot of changes coming in the next few years. Um, but at the same time, I believe that it cannot do what we want it to do without a human touch. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, it's always best to have us as human beings using AI as a tool and it, that tool could be powerful. You know, that tool could be as powerful as we know how to develop it. But at the same time, I strongly believe in the human uh, input, the human aspect. Just on the question David asked earlier, how to make ChatGPT works better. We need to guide it. We need to give it some instructions, a good one, um, for it to really deliver the result that we want. Yeah, Bobby's comment on the nuclear power was that um, as AI usage grows and the amount of uh, servers needed, the you know the the power requirements will exceed the capacity of the existing power grid unless uh, you know additional capacity is kind of put in there. So. Um, let's see, Bevan asks uh, AI in regards to this is different than average uses for people and businesses. Maybe give us a little bit more context there. Um, so Ben, in, in your your just general day, um, what what is the number one task that you use AI for in a normal day? Um, th this is. Uh... Like on my daily basis, I use AI a lot for content creation because mm -hmm. um, I run the Center for Talent and Workforce Development. So there's a lot of communication I have to do every single day from email to Facebook to LinkedIn to almost every single thing. And sometimes I need AI to help me fine tune what I send out there, the message I want to send out there. For example, um, if I want to make an announcement for an event that I will have next week or so, instead of me trying to figure out exactly how to say it, I will just write the outline and the specific information and then the tone and the voice that I want it to be. And then I just give that entire task for ChatGPT and it, it just give me the result I want. Yeah, so <laughs> content creation is something that I use a lot. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite tool? Do you are you just generally uh, specific to ChatGPT, or do you use uh, something else? 
I use chat ChatGPT for most of the time. Um, and you know, it depends on what you do. For example, if I want to do research, I would use uh, perplexity. Okay. Uh, if I want to use uh, some, uh, I would like to do logo or something like that, I might want to use Copilot. But for the majority of what I do, ChatGPT can cover it. Um, I have used Google Gemini and Microsoft Copilot already, and by all means, they are great. But there are pros and cons in mm -hmm. each of them. So, yeah, my favorite one is still ChatGPT. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, Thomas says, excellent presentation. Looking forward to your recommended list. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, it's, we're at the top of the hour. So, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been spectacular. It's been so interesting. I really thank you for everything you shared with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to meet with all of you. And thank you so much, Dave and Janet, for this this great time. And I really hope that uh, you enjoy the presentation. And if there's any other questions or anything that could help, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I have my contact info on the screen and I'm looking forward to the next webinar or the next opportunity, uh, opportunity to collaborate with you in the future. All right. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Jana, for driving the ship as always. And um, we will see everyone next week. Or no, let's see, next week we'll be off because of uh, the election day, but um, we'll see you in two weeks and uh, join us for another Toolkit Tuesday. So thank you. Have a good Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye.